Hey friends, it's Masood. Welcome back to Med School Moose. This is going to be USMLE Step 2 CK High Yield Facts Part 3. Hopefully you've had a chance to watch Parts 1 and 2 by now. I've been receiving a lot of good feedback from students hearing that it's really helpful for their exam, so I'm really happy to hear that, and I will definitely be making more of these videos. Remember, this is randomized, rapid-fire, high yield questions and answers for Step 2 CK, also very high yield for Complex Level 2 CE, so let's just jump right into it. Be sure that you're subscribed to receive all the videos in the series as as well as some other high yield updates and information. Let's get to it. What is the inheritance pattern for hemophilia A and hemophilia B? Hopefully this is something that you remember from step one. Hemophilia A and B are both X-linked recessive. Remember hemophilia A, there is a deficiency of factor eight, and hemophilia B, there is a deficiency of factor nine. In conjunction with that, what is the inheritance pattern of hemophilia C? Obviously I have it on a different slide, so it's gonna be different. This one is actually autosomal recessive, and this is a deficiency of factor 11. So make sure you know those distinctions. Hemophilia A and B, X-linked recessive. Hemophilia C, autosomal recessive inheritance pattern. An anterior hip dislocation can injure the blank nerve. Well, it's going to be the obturator nerve. Important thing to note here, anterior hip dislocations, they're not very common. They're about less than 10% of all hip dislocations. The majority of them are posterior from injuries like car accidents. But if you do get an anterior hip dislocation, you want to be aware that that can cause an injury to the obturator nerve. Moving on, what is the best initial treatment for menopause? Remember, with step 2 CK, there is more of an emphasis on disease processes, knowing the gold standard of treatment, the first line treatment, gold standard of diagnosis, things like that. So the best initial treatment for menopause is going to be hormonal replacement therapy. Typically, this is going to be a combination therapy of estrogen and progestin, and this is generally indicated for patients that are symptomatic who are less than 60 years old without contraindication. So a few different things to note there, but just know that the best initial treatment for menopause is hormonal replacement therapy. Getting to some other various randomized treatments here, what is the treatment for congenital hypothyroidism? Well, this one is going to be levothyroxine, right? The important thing to note is patients with congenital hypothyroidism really need to be avoiding things that contain soy, a lot of calcium, a lot of iron, because it can cause decreased drug absorption but we are treating that with levothyroxine. What is the duration of symptoms for a diagnosis of schizophreniform to be made? Guys, be sure that you know these distinctions between these psychiatric disorders. This is something that it's really easy to get tripped up on, but hopefully that doesn't happen. Schizophreniform disorder is one to six months of symptoms. Once it gets greater than six months, that's when we start calling it schizophrenia. So really just be sure that you know that nomenclature. One to six months is schizophreniform. If we're getting to longer periods than that, it'll be schizophrenia. And as a side note, that does tend to be the case with a lot of psychiatric disorders is once it gets to six months, the diagnosis kind of changes, how we name it kind of changes. So just be aware of that. But now what about if it's less than one month? What is the diagnosis for psychosis lasting less than one month? In this case, it's going to be a brief psychotic disorder. So really just make sure that you understand the duration of these symptoms can cause changes with the name. So if it's less than one month of these psychosis symptoms, it's a brief psychotic disorder. One to six months, then we're talking about schizophreniform disorder, and then greater than six months is when we start diagnosing schizophrenia. Make sure that you have that in order in your mind. What is the most common site for intracranial aneurysms to occur? This is going to be at the junction of the anterior communicating artery and the anterior cerebral artery. This accounts for about 35% of all intracranial aneurysms, so just know this is the most common site, is this junction between these two main arteries. Bisset syndrome is common in what demonstration? demographic. Bisset syndrome is going to be common in males of Turkish or Middle Eastern descent. Remember this Bisset syndrome is an autoimmune vasculitis. It can result in recurrent painful, painful oral and genital ulcers. And of course, the demographic that we want to associate with that, males of Turkish and Middle Eastern origin. So that's pretty high yield to know. An anterior shoulder dislocation can injure the blank nerve. I guess we're talking about a lot of dislocations and nerve injuries today. An anterior shoulder dislocation can injure the axillary nerve. Is haptoglobin increased or decreased in hemolysis? It's going to be decreased in hemolysis. Remember, haptoglobin, this is a protein that binds to free hemoglobin from destroyed red blood cells to prevent free radical formation. So if you have hemolysis of red blood cells, you have a lot of hemoglobin spilling into the blood. 
haptoglobin is going to bind to that and the total amount of haptoglobin is going to decrease. That is why, you know, when we're worried about a patient that might have hemolysis, DIC, that kind of thing in the hospital, we order a haptoglobin level to see if that's decreased. So important to know that both for the boards and also for real life. What is the best initial treatment for a small bowel obstruction? Generally, this is just going to be fluid resuscitation, right? The initial treatment for small bowel obstruction is going to be pretty conservative. So it's going to be fluid resuscitation, other things like supportive care, keeping the patient NPO, nothing by mouth, inserting an NG tube, bowel rest, those kinds of things. This is the initial treatment. Certainly, if a patient is improving, if they have worsening of their symptoms, they may need surgical resection, that kind of thing. But again, make sure that you're reading these questions very slowly initial treatment for small bowel obstruction is fluid resuscitation. Moving on to this next one, what is the best initial test to diagnose non-Hodgkin lymphoma? This is going to be an excisional lymph node biopsy. Hopefully you've heard this again and again from me at this point, but really be sure that you're reading these questions very slowly. See if it's the initial test, the first line treatment, the gold standard, just make sure you know what it's asking you so that you're not making silly mistakes and losing points on test day. What is the treatment of choice for malignant otitis externa? This is going to be IV ciprofloxacin. Remember for cases like this of a malignant otitis externa, we really need pseudomonas coverage. That's why we're going to be using something like a fluoroquinolone, like an IV ciprofloxacin. Certainly, you can use other medications. Ceftazidime is an option. Cefepime is an option. But generally, the first-line treatment is going to be an IV ciprofloxacin. What is the most accurate test to diagnose Sheehan syndrome? So again, reading the question here, this one's asking the most accurate test. What is the best test, essentially? And it's going to be an MRI of the pituitary gland as well as the hypothalamus. Remember, maybe from step one, Sheehan syndrome, this is also known as postpartum pituitary necrosis, which I think that makes a lot more sense than calling it Sheehan syndrome, but that's just me. But this disease is an ischemia and necrosis of the anterior pituitary gland. It can lead to massive obstetric hemorrhage and shock. Patients can be very sick. Just know the most accurate test to diagnose that is an MRI of the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus. What is the treatment for a patient on warfarin with an INR of less than 4.5 and no bleeding? So guys, questions like this are super important. This is important for the boards. This is also important for real life. We still have patients that are taking warfarin. We need to know what their INR is. We need to know if they have bleeding symptoms, that kind of thing. So I'm going to read this again. Make sure that you're with me. What is the treatment for a patient on warfarin, INR less than 4.5, and no bleeding? The treatment in that situation is just going to be the hold the next dose of warfarin. Okay, we may need to also reevaluate that maintenance dose. You know, if this is something that's been reoccurring again and again, might need to have that dose lowered. But an INR less than 4.5, no bleeding. We're just holding that next dose of warfarin. Contrary to that, what is the treatment for a patient on warfarin with an INR of 4.5 to 10, so a higher INR, and no bleeding? In this case, we're going to be holding the next several doses of warfarin. And because that INR is a little bit higher, up to 10, we may consider some oral vitamin K at this point. And then taking the next step further, what is the treatment for a patient on warfarin with an INR greater than 10 now, still no bleeding? In this case, we're going to discontinue the warfarin altogether. We're going to be giving oral vitamin K. And then finally, what is the treatment for a patient on warfarin with bleeding regardless of the INR. We're going to discontinue the warfarin. We are now moving on to give IV vitamin K as well as PCC. And of course, because this patient is bleeding, they're at very high risk. We need to be monitoring that INR very, very closely. If this is confusing, if that's not clear, rewind this video another minute, watch those questions again, because this is very, very high yield. Very important to know those things. What is the most feared complication of giant cell arteritis? Remember, this used to be called temporal arteritis, but that name's kind of fallen out of favor now. Most feared complication of giant cell arteritis is blindness. And this is due to anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. Can you remember the treatment for giant cell arteritis? It's going to be high dose prednisone. So just know that this is a feared complication, but we're still treating that with some high dose steroids. Guys, as always, thank you so much for watching. Click here on the left to watch Step 2 CK High Yield Facts Part 1, and here on the right will be Step 2 CK High Yield Facts Part 2. Be sure that you're subscribed to receive all of the videos in this series, as well as the rest of my high yield content, and I will catch you in the next one.